All right. So, welcome everyone. I'm basically going to be your host today. Um, we are running the Intercoin show this time from my Mac, uh, and we have a lot of people. Um, so I wanted to kind of go around the room if anyone wants to, uh, you know, first the hosts, uh, introduce yourselves and what you do at Intercoin, and then if anyone would like to introduce themselves, uh, we love we always love new guests. So please, um, let's start it off. Uh, Marcy. Thank you, Greg. I'll probably start. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to our show. Uh, we meet every Wednesday at 12 o'clock Eastern Time or New York Time Zone, where we talk about different topics in cryptocurrency, NFTs, blockchain, and smart contracts. Here with you today, this is Marcella Piauchak. I'm Intercoin's media director. I've been with the team for more than a year now and has been quite a journey so far. So many things have been developed and so many things we have achieved as a team. So we're very excited to bring more and more people to our movement and continue to spread awareness on how to make crypto go mainstream. So on today's panel, we have three different panels today. So the first panel discussion, uh, we're going to talk about the valuation of NFTs for investors. So what factors to consider and so on. So with me today, I wanted to introduce Amir Soleiman. I hope I pronounced it correctly. <laughs> Correct me if I'm not wrong. Uh, he's a um, uh, founder at Adelina uh, Adelia Art Gallery. So welcome. Can you just make sure uh, that your audio works correctly? If you can say hello. Amir, yeah, can you yes. hear us? Hi, 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 everyone. Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Is this is on the right? Yes, it's perfect. Yes. All right. Okay. So yeah, I mean, you said everything. My name is Amir Soleimani. I'm, I'm known in the NFT space by Mundo IR, and I've been an art collector and also active uh, member of the community in the NFT space. Uh, happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Amir. And just to kind of give others an introduction about you, um, uh, you know, let us know if anything is in the curate, but from what we kind of gathered, we saw that you have a really good passion for technology. And as a programmer, you really enjoy setting up web applications, connecting them to IoT services and so more. So I've noticed that you also enjoy studying cryptocurrency technology and investing in cryptocurrencies. And you also are the founder of Adelia Art Gallery. So you can all uh, go to www.adelia.com and you can see a lot of the beautiful art uh, that Amir has, uh, you know, for people to buy online as well. So uh, beside the contemporary and pop art section, um, Adelia Art Gallery has also a vast inventory of our erotica artworks and provides services as well. So we really wanted to like welcome you to our show and really looking forward um, to the discussion that you'll have monitored by one of our business advisors here, Elena Rivers. And with that said, I wanted to also introduce another speaker for the first panel, uh, Mitchell Galvin. Welcome, Mitchell. Hi, hi yeah, no, nice, to, nice to speak to everyone. Um, my name's Mitch. Um, I, I've been involved in NFTs, I guess, since the start of the year, starting out on Ethereum. Um, and now I do most of my stuff on Solana. So um, I'm actually building out three different projects on Solana as we speak, one of which is a marketplace called Soul Art Market. And then we've got two NFT projects that link in together, which is Billionaire Bats Club and also uh, something called the, the Toad Boys. So yeah, that, that's a little bit about me, I guess. Yeah, that was a great introduction. So you saved me the tag and I was actually going to mention that, so welcome. And I'll uh, also introduce, since I have here on the panel, um, Leila Pinto. Uh, Leila, you'll probably be on the second panel discussion, but we can briefly um, introduce you as well so people know who is on the panel today to discuss. Uh, are you with us? Can you hear us? Yes. Hi, Marcella. Can you hear me? Thank you. I hear you perfectly fine. Uh, just to give others a little bit of introduction about you. Um, so you are um, uh, an artist and you, your art is kind of influenced by your unique experience, you know, from having grown up and traveled internationally and worked on Wall Street as one of the few women managing directors in the world of finance. Uh, you have lived in Manhattan for the past 30 years and, you know, have spent endless hours in museums and galleries looking and learning about art before, you know, you took up painting. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. 
and I'm new to NFTs, so um, I just wanted to add that um, thanks to uh, Elena and Norman who uh, uh, encouraged me to go to NFT NYC. I, I got a fast track to the space. I, I actually started uh, watching the space since early this year when the people news hit, and I just minted my first uh, art as NFTs a few weeks back on Rarible. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Leila. And uh, for everyone that is new to the show, make sure you stay tuned because the second uh, panel discussion will be with Leila and actually one of our team members, Alicia Anglin, uh, which are both kind of like NFTs artists and they're going to have a really good discussion together. Alicia, if you want to quickly introduce yourself so others can get to know you before we start with panel one. Hello, everyone. Uh, Alicia Anglin here, and I'm new, uh, part of the Intercoin community. I'm a community manager, and I just recently actually joined Interco Intercoin community, and um, I'm an abstract artist. I've been an abstract artist for 15 years, and recently this April got into NFTs. Um, so we're going to have a great discussion about that today, and I'm just glad to be here. So thanks for having me. Thank you. And uh, lastly, Elena, <laughs> uh, you'll be the moderator of the first panel. So I'll leave you to your introduction and, you know, take it from there. Uh, by the way, before Elena starts, just wanted to quickly introduce Carter, Norman, and a few other people that are on the team. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know, I'd love for Norman and Carter to sort of uh, chime in and, and say a bit about yourselves and um, how you uh, discovered Intercoin and what you've been doing. Yeah, happy to um, go over a little bit. It's good to see some familiar faces on this call. So, you know, I started getting into crypto basically, I think four years ago by now. Just found out about it on the online forum. Um, definitely the community was part of what drew me into it at first. So I started going to a lot of conference found out about, you know, some of the wonderful people here at Intercoin. Maybe four years ago, just at a, well, three years ago, technically, for being precise, at a, just a casual meetup type of event, and been involved with it ever since. Um, Carter, you want to talk a little bit about, you know, some of the work you're doing here, uh, how you got involved. I think that'll be, I think that'll be very helpful as well. Yeah, hi, so yeah, I'm Carter. Uh, I'm quite new to Intercoin as well, probably from the last two months. Uh, I've been into crypto since early uh, 2017, and like a lot of people, uh, kind of been waiting for it to kind of go mainstream and actually get used in a, you know, by everyday people. Uh, and I connected with Stacey, so obviously part of the team as well, on Twitter, and, you know, she spoke about Intercoin, and it, it just grabbed my attention. Um, it's great to be involved in some way and, you know, helping build the community, getting the word out, out there about Intercoin and, you know, let's see, you know, technology getting used dated by, you know, everyday people. Um, and not only that, for, you know, really having a really positive impact on communities as well, you know, really change people's lives and, you know, make a big difference. So, yeah, really exciting time to be involved with Intercoin. Well, let's give it back. To Elena, yep. Elena, hey. Let me know if your mic's working. Hey, everyone. Yep. Yes, my mic is working. We tested it before. Uh, so now uh, I will introduce myself. Uh, I'm Elena Rivers. Uh, I am based in UK. I met Greg uh, three years ago, and uh, uh, we decided that I will step up as an advisor uh, on Intercoin project last year, uh, because I actually fell in love with the idea of community currencies, and for me personally, integrity and uh, possibilities for any community to uh, to have their own uh, crypto, uh, it it would bring freedom to everyone. And I really believe in the project that we will grow uh, globally. And uh, the reason for today's call actually, uh, NFGs, because we have amazing news that Greg will 
uh, tell you a little bit more later on the, our experts panel. But now I would like to uh, call to speak actually uh, Mitch and uh, Amir, because we have uh, our first panel uh, about art and how people actually can evaluate art and all the regarding uh, their involvement in art. So my first question would be to Amir. Um, how did you start? How did you come up with the idea of NFTs in your life? Uh, how, did, how it all began and um, make you quite popular in UK? I recently met uh, Amir uh, on an NFT event in London and uh, it actually was an amazing event and we had a lovely conversation about the future of NFTs for everyone. And Amir, what's for you? The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Elena. Well, I've been into cryptos like I think it was 2013 or 12. Um, and I think I bought my first NFT in 2017. It wasn't called NFTs at the time. It was like on the arts and Ethereum, right? So I bought a project called uh, Cryptons and they were doing, they were a community of artists. They were doing uh, famous people like politicians, celebrities. They were creating like uh, funny pictures of them and they were technically minting them on the Ethereum blockchain. I ended up buying some of like uh, those uh, 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 politician pictures. And then obviously I got into Gods Unchained. Like, I mean, I think almost everyone got into Gods Unchained. And then suddenly everything stopped. Fast forward to, uh, to 2020, like, at the end of 2020, uh, my art dealer in Hong Kong, he said, you should get into NFTs. Like you should go to this website, don't buy meme.com, get their token and stake it and get uh, some other tokens. Then you will be able to buy artworks and people is going to drop there. So everything was like too much for me at the time. It took me two days to get my head around it, even though I, I mean, I was into crypto and everything, but it was really hard to understand to get my head around, like buying a token and then stake and then another token and all sorts of things. And then I did the same thing. I went to that website. I think my first piece was from Yoshes on that website, don'tbuymeme.com. And then it all started. Uh, I think one of my very first serious buys was on Nifty Gateway and then I started like to connect with all those amazing people in the NFT space, uh, community leaders, community builders. One of the people that I met was called Jean, and sadly we lost Jean. Uh, I think in August due to the COVID, uh, he actually connected many of the people active in the NFT space today. He was he was going with the name Wolf Lion in the clubhouse back in days. So. Uh, yeah, this is this is how I came to know NFTs, and now I'm 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 like part of the community, and I don't think that any of my days goes without buying something, bidding on some, something, or or doing some discussions around NFTs. So basically, you've got a lot of. Um... Back to you, William. Basically, I just wanted to say you, you sound like you have quite a journey in the NFT space. What would you say you see as like the changes in the space since you first uh, started, you know, looking at these things? Well, I think one of the great things that uh, NFT invaded from the crypto community is actually the community itself. So in the NFT space, the community, I believe, is the main factor because unlike traditional artwork, I mean, I, I've been a collector, fine art collector for many years. I think my, my fine art collection is about like more than 700 pieces from paintings, sculptures, and like prints and everything. Um, but 
in, in the fine art space, even though I have amazing pieces from amazing artists, both blue chip and emerging, but I, I never had a chance to actually talk with them, right? But in NFT space, I bought a piece from Fiocious and he actually came to Liverpool to my gallery to deliver a suitcase full of notes and paintings and like a lot of gifts. And with him was like Ryan Thank You X, Cory Van Lu, all those amazing people in the NFT space. Like the, the biggest figure in the NFT space these days is Beeple, right? And you cannot believe how easy it is to connect with people, start a conversation. So these these kind of connections, like personal connections between the collector and the artist was not present prior to NFTs. And I think the NFT, it, what, what, what the NFT is doing actually is NFT is part of a greater movement, which is Web3. And that Web3 is actually changing the social structure of how we as people and communities are dealing with, with each other both in financially or, or socializing. Everything is being affected by Web3. And NFT is actually part of a greater thing, which is Web3. And it's like a reform in, in socializing or, 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 or financial relations between people. I hope I, I gave you sort of an answer to your question. Uh, even though no, that was fantastic. Actually, that's what Intercoin is all about. I just wanted to tie it in with our mission and what we are doing as a company. Intercoin helps to serve entire communities. Our focus is on helping communities to connect, communicate, transact, collaborate. And so NFTs are a big part of that. And like you said, Web3 is a big revolution. I see Web3 as the bigger space than just NFTs or just DeFi or anything. And I was just on a call today with some people that we're helping um, potentially create coins for including uh, some political parties, which I'll talk about in another show. Um, and we talked about how we could have organizations keep uh, roles and permissions on the blockchain so people can look in their wallet and they could take out their wallet and say, you know, I, am, I have this uh, role in this community or I have that role in that community. I'm a teacher at NYU. New York University, I am a police officer in this city or online, I'm this moderator in this thing. And so that kind of status symbol uh, matters and it's a very community-based approach and it could be represented by an NFT. Um, so basically what um, there's a broader conversation that it, we keep having with people from the socio-political space, uh, people in politics trying to change uh, society uh, perhaps to have a universal basic income or all kinds of uh, things where they're trying to help people essentially get by. Uh, but there's also uh, people on the other side with uh, voting, uh, reforming the voting system and so on. What I see is uh, Web3 is essentially the big feature of Web3 that Web2 doesn't have is uh, the immutable nature of the smart contract. So for the first time, people have to follow the rules of the program and they can't simply log into the database and change the data. You know, when somebody gives you a credential, this is the people we're talking about to, about today was talking about verifiable credentials. This is a, uh, this is uh, something verifiable credentials are a web standard. Um, basically any organization an open, standard for digital credentials, an organization can go ahead and issue to you a credential that then you can display. And it used to be called verifiable claims that you could take a, you can uh, take a test, uh, you know, whether you have the coronavirus on a certain day in a certain lab, and the lab would say that you had, let's say, negative test, uh, you know, you don't have the coronavirus. So the fact that this happened uh, is, uh, you know, the credential is, let's say, issued or minted by the organization until now has been a black box. It means that if you have some sort of, um, let's say, a position somewhere, we don't know if that was issued because somebody logged into the database, your friend, and simply made you the president of the chess club or made you a police officer. So there could be corruption in the system. But with blockchain, we know the process that led to you having this uh, position. Uh, you know, maybe it's a democratic election. 
Uh, maybe the mayor has um, appointed you or something like that. So with the blockchain, we can actually start trusting the, the status symbols that people have. And so Web3, to me, whether it's about voting or about uh, NFTs, status symbols, badges, roles, anything really, it's about the trust. And for the first time, we have computer programs that we can trust because the alternative is like on the web. This document was currently served to me by a server running somewhere in a uh, data center, but it's owned by wikipedia.org. And I have to trust Wikipedia to not serve me something malicious, right? And I have to know that um, any day Wikipedia can change, uh, you know, the the content on this website. So when we have a web 2.0 and we have people constantly moving things around and adding things and having talk pages and uh, especially with Wikipedia, right? You can edit stuff. They all trust the central website to, to uh, serve them. Whereas with web three, you don't have to trust any website because the rules stand by themselves. So basically what I see is the innovation of Web3 is the trust is now being put finally into the programs and not into institutions and into people. So that, I just wanted to put that and out that there. that's actually, that, uh, it's a great point. And that's actually why uh, we invited today on a call our another speaker, uh, Mitch. And let's give him a floor to introduce himself properly with the history, how much you actually started with the NFTs. Please go ahead. Yeah, Tell sure. So, your story. Yeah, no worries. So I suppose uh, historically I was investing in DeFi uh, and these, these sort of, uh, these sort of things. And then, um, I sort of found out about NFTs, like I said, um, probably around April, April, I first started investing and um, I just liked how, so I guess similar to how uh, that chap's just described, you know, an NFT doesn't have to necessarily be uh, just, a, just a piece of art or a JPEG or whatever, an NFT can actually be uh proof of concept or proof of ownership so um you know what what you might do now when for example where i see nfts going um you know you might buy a house now and you get given the deeds whereas now that'll be an nft or you go to university and you get a degree you won't you won't get a paper degree you'll get an nft so um, that's where I see the future of NFTs. But sorry, no, the reason I got into them was, uh, I mean, initially, if I'm completely honest, probably from a financial standpoint, I saw that there was a lot to be made initially um, from, an, from an investor's uh, perspective. So um, I was lucky enough to be early on uh, a few NFT projects like Board 8 Yacht Club um, amongst, amongst some others. So um, and this brought me on to finding the problems of gas fees uh, being extraordinarily high, which is why I um, started investigating other blockchains, which led me to Solana. Um, and then I fell in and love with you, Solana. You will, you will get a chance to talk about uh, gas fee with, together with Greg on the panel <laughs> where, where we're going to have later on with Greg sure. uh, expert panel about current trades and trends. Yeah. But at the moment, what I want to ask to talk about is actually uh, the art uh, of NFGs and the factors, how you actually uh, consider when you evaluate in the specific value of the NFGs, how mm. you're finding it, whether the price is correct uh, for you in terms of buying it. As a collector yourself, yeah, yeah. As a as the collector it's i guess it's tricky i mean you i mean don't be wrong i've had <laughs> i've had collections that i've bought and um they've not done so well so i bought a collection i probably spent three ethereum's worth um you know in, in usd whatever that would be like over ten thousand dollars and they're now all worth zero so you know it can <laughs> it can go both ways um but the only real thing you can do is um you know I suppose from that, like my investment strategy now is, do I like it? Do I care if it goes to zero? 
And ultimately, if, if you like the art and you don't care if it goes to zero, that's probably the best place to start because then you're not too worried about the financial side of it. But um, the other aspect is look into things like the project's roadmap. So I guess similar with DeFi, but look into the team's roadmap, look into to find out, uh, have the team, have that team done a project before? Have they delivered on their word? Are they, do- and, and not necessarily about just docs, because it's all very well having a docs team, but if they're doxed and no one's ever heard of them, then that's, they might as well not be doxed. So um, it's a tricky one. Yeah, it is a tricky one when it comes to investing. <laughs> I, I find, of course, always only invest what you can afford to lose. And I suppose, uh, yeah, you, you just need to kind of buy what you, you genuinely like so that maybe you're not worried so much about the price. If the price does surge, then that's a bonus. But um, yeah, I, I suppose the, the collections that I've done well on, things like Broad Ape, I mean, the reason that they've done so well is they don't really talk about what they're doing, they just do it. So, exactly. Um, yeah, that's why. Uh, Amir, done so well. what about you? Uh, what about your strategy? Uh, how do you evaluate your art, uh, your collection? in your gallery or in your open sea? Amir, please unmute yourself. Okay, uh, we probably have some kind you of You might have been disconnected, Elena. I right. see him on the... I, I think yeah, he dropped off. Some kind of technical di- difficulties. That's okay. This in this case, uh, we can move on. It's just the time uh, for us uh, to give ladies to speak between each other. We have wonderful two artists and uh, let's give them a floor and later on we will get back into technology of NFTs uh, with Greg and Mitch. So, Leila, please Hi, Elena. Uh, yeah. take your time. And uh, we still have Alicia. Alicia, how is your sound? Is it uh, working already? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, Yes. I can hear you. Perfect. Thank you very much. So uh, this time it's law for you to discuss uh, NFTs, how you work with NFTs and what is your stages uh, with your art gallery as well. Alicia, since you've um, started this since April, uh, I'd love to hear about your journey. Like, what was your first interaction with NFTs and and why? Uh, Perhaps if you can also share with us which marketplace or marketplaces you chose, uh, that might be helpful. Yeah, so um, I'll just start off with um, I've been an abstract artist now for about 15 years, uh, traditional, you know, physical art. Um, Also partnered with Wayfair two years ago. I just had my two year anniversary um, of my partnership with Wayfair. Um, You can see my credentials if anybody's new here, uh, MotleyEye.com. I do not have a LinkedIn at this time. I got into NFTs in April, actually. I was on Instagram and I came across Mark Cuban's story and he was talking about um, NFTs and as well as the NFT account on Instagram. And I was like, what is this NFTs? So my husband's actually been into crypto and investing for quite some time. So he kind of uh, told me about that as well. And then I opened up a wallet. I redid my own research. I went on OpenSea and I started, I minted my first piece, which was Sublime Fields. That was in April. It took about a month uh, or so to sell. I also had, I also had that on Mark Cuban's website. I had linked my um, wallet on lazy.com, which is Mark Cuban's, um, it's a lazy minting platform, just like OpenSea. So Basically, you connect your wallet and what lazy minting means, it's a way of minting an NFT without having to pay the upfront gas fees. So uh, basically, you're able to mint your NFT for free. You do pay gas for the first NFT, but after that, a lot of artists like using OpenSea. So I went all in with OpenSea because of that. And um, since then, I've, I've done pretty well. 
Um, and the thing that I really think is great about NFTs and, and why another reason why I'm into NFTs and I'm also still doing my physicals, but um, I think they're great because they live permanently on the blockchain. And for once your art is sold, you can also receive, um, let's say 10% in royalties every time an item is sold. And this is an excellent way um, to make a little extra money as well and also have multiple um, buyers. So it's kind of cool that you're able to do that because in the physical world, as you know, we don't get royalties for once I sell a piece and I ship it off to New York or wherever it gets shipped. Um, I never see that piece again and I never really hear about it again. It winds up in that person's home or in their office and um, there's really nothing else uh, other than my love for it, there's really nothing else um, going on with it, right? So I think this is a great thing for artists. You know, this is the new thing. And um, I always, you know, I have a lot of artists asking me like on Instagram, oh my God, I see you selling stuff. Like, how do I get into it? And I've been really, really helping them out a lot. And I always tell them, well, try OpenSea first because you only have to pay gas on your first mint you know, first mint fee and it's a great way to get started so um i have all the ethereum right now nfts i have looked into other things but i just right now i know gas is high but i just that's just what i what i'm doing it's worked for me um i've sold many nfts in two different collections and uh my most recent collection is actually it's really um it's really in my heart uh, it's the black label collection. I just wanted to quickly share that because it means a lot to me because it's actually 25% of those sales of those hundred pieces of abstract art. 25% um, of those actually go to the national Alliance to end homelessness. And that's very dear to me. So um, you can find that on my Twitter page as well. So I just wanted to share that. And also any, um, another piece of advice for any new artists getting into NFTs. A lot of us start on Instagram. If you don't have a Twitter, Twitter is um, dire. Like you have to have a Twitter account to have to be in the NFT community and um, speak with your fellow, you know, NFT artists. So I think that's a great way. So if anybody doesn't have a Twitter account, definitely get one because you would absolutely love the community that we have there. So yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Um, so that's uh, that's that's what I've been doing all year. So it's been quite the ride. That's super helpful, Alicia. Thank you. Um, and I just had a follow on question, uh, and that was about additions. So have you been selling one of ones or have you been minting, you know, limited additions? Because I, I'm thinking of doing that as well. I mean, I started to do that with like a series of 10 on variables. So if you can speak to that, I think that would be helpful. Uh, both for me as well as for other artists that are um, absolutely to. absolutely Layla so um for me I personally like one of ones um since the artwork is so original and it takes so much time to create these pieces um I have seen artists do you know even editions of like a hundred of the same piece I personally think it makes them extremely rare when you do one of ones because there's only one on the blockchain and basically I mean that's just my opinion I think it holds its value. Um, so I would definitely, you know, it's something to think about, but all of mine, I don't have any duplications of, uh, of, of mine. I don't have uh, a set, you know, uh, no, they're just one of one. So, and then what I'm doing now is, is something that no other artist is really doing. What I'm doing with my Alicia Anglin art collection on OpenSea is that for once an NFT is sold, I know this sounds crazy and people might think it's crazy, but I'm actually taking the piece and I have it shredded and recycled. Um, and that solely, that way that piece solely lives on the blockchain. Um, so that's kind of crazy. And then you get a free matching uh, custom cell phone case that you can flaunt or you can even gift with each person purchase of my NFT. So yes, the artist, I'm not giving the physical for that specific collection, but it is being shredded um, live and I do post those videos. Um, that's just something that's just kind of like my thing of recycling and also bringing that back in. So, so yeah, it's completely up to you as the artist. I think a lot of artists, some artists do really well with multiple editions, but, 
um, or, or uh, multiplies of the actual piece. But I like one of ones, and my collector seems to like that too. So that's just something to keep in mind. Thank you, Alicia. So, it, so uh, I mean, that, that sounds like kind of what I have done thus far, IRL. So I have sold, uh, you know, some of my paintings to collectors and they've only been one of ones. So I have not done uh, editions thus far. So thank you for sharing that. And the plan that I have, and obviously this, I'm, I'm brand new to this, is um, my plan is to deliver the artwork with the one-on-one. -on -one. So you mentioned that you shred yours, but um, so my plan is, and of course, if the collector doesn't want it, then you know that that's a different story. Um, and, and I've just started to make mine on wearable, and um, I think they have a, a lazy minting option as well. So um, so that's you know that's as far as um, I, I've progressed on, on on this. So that was very helpful. But I, I had a really busy summer, uh, you know, having uh, been all of us were locked down in 2020 as far as exhibitions and so on. Um, so I had a lot of IRL shows. I was, I was really busy uh, both uh, showing my work. I had a few studio visits. Uh, I'm both in New York City and Long Island and in the winter, possibly spending some time down south. So. Um, yeah, it's been very exciting and I really look forward to learning more about NFTs and I'm all in. I mean, I'm, I'm very excited, but I am trading carefully. I'm, I'm going slow um, just because it's, it's um, you know, I, I, I don't want to get in over my head, so to speak. And so um, Elena has been uh, wonderful. She's been an evangelist in the space, as have Norman. Uh, both, both of them from Intercoin, and yes, I am new to the Twitter community. So you brought up a good point, Alicia, because thus far I have pretty much only shown my artwork on Instagram, and my Instagram same here, there, same here, oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, it's at uh, Lila Pinto NYC. That's my handle on Instagram. It's Greg wants to pull that up, uh, Greg or Marcella. Yes, and I will, I will follow you on there, and I think I already followed you on Twitter. So if you ever have any questions or anything, please feel free to DM me if you have a question about a platform or you're looking to maybe do something else and you, you don't, you're not sure, you can always, re, you know, just DM me. That's perfectly fine. I'm going to go ahead and um, follow you as well on um, IG, and uh, I don't, I'm not sure if I did yet or not, but I will. And my, my, handle, my handle's at Alicia Anglin Art on IG, so if you see that incoming with my face, you'll see it. that'll be my uh, my account. So, yeah, that's um, I'm really excited for you. It's going to be a whole new adventure because it definitely is a whole different realm, and you're going to love, like, the NFT community, and that's definitely, you know, uh, my best advice, you know, from, from me and from my experience since April. Try rotating the globe and exploring different countries. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, I was just saying that, um, you know, that's just basically that you could do whatever you want with NFTs. And that's the beauty of it. You know, us, us artists, the, the lovely thing that I like is the um, royalties as well. That's another thing because, you know, first and foremost, it's our passion, right? We love to paint. And I think that comes first, but of course, you know, every artist uh, needs to make a living too. So um, I think it's really awesome that we're able to give give that opportunity because with physicals, you know, we can't do that. So that's not something where we can, you know, keep getting royalties and stuff like that. So it's just really cool. And I can't wait to see like where everything's going to take us. And I'm really excited about Intercoin because Intercoin is going to be having uh, an NFT marketplace of their own. So I'm really excited to mm -hmm. be a part of Intercoin and then as well um, with that. So definitely look out for that as well. So it'll be really exciting. Thank you, Alicia. I really appreciate your offer of, of help and support, especially on Twitter. Um, so I appreciate that. And, you know, I just wanted to mention that thus far, uh, my website has been uh, key uh, in terms of showcasing my art. Uh, and it's my name, uh, Greg or Marcilda. It's uh, L-E-I-L-A Pinto dot com. And um, so I have to kind of work on getting some more of my pieces migrated from there onto uh, the blockchain. 
Yeah, so it's definitely, yeah, I know with Rarible, yeah. you're paying yeah. gas, though, to mint every time, right? Yeah. Um, with the lazy minting option, I believe it's the bio. You're right, uh, the bio pays. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, because I know with, like, Rarible, I think I, I only have one on there. I have a verified account on Rarible, but I only minted one because... The gas has been outrageous, and I just kind of went back to my open sea thing because that's where all of my my stuff is. So, just something to to think about. You can be on as many platforms as you'd like. That's the great thing. I mean, I personally like to stay on, you know, most on one, but um, I definitely think, you know, open sea. They started uh, back in 2017. They were the original um, NFT marketplace that I know Crypto Kitties uh, was one of the one of the first ones there and um it's definitely something to look into as well and they you know i'm definitely um i'm just i'm just more excited about i can't wait for intercoin to have their marketplace because i'm already <laughs> part of the community so i'm like ready to go with that so i love to sort of yeah just jump in here and talk about that um this is the intercoin greg, roadmap i'm sorry greg i'm sorry you would have your time with mitchell to talk about um, different platforms after the art uh, platform will finish. We have another 15 minutes oh, yeah. available to talk with uh, by the hour uh, time, I mean, uh, for Leila to talk about actually her art. Mm -hmm. And uh, she already been on different art galleries as well as on the Wall Street. Uh, Leila, can you tell us more about it? Because it's kind of amazing. So um, thank you. Thanks so much. Um, Greg, if you you know want to go back to my website, you know that might be helpful. Um, I have a, a tab there for, for galleries. Again, it's my name, which is Lila Pinto, L-E-I-L-A pinto.com sure and um yeah so so thank you elena so just real quickly uh, to back up i'm a new york based artist and i've worked in the financial sector for the last couple of decades um greg if you hit the works tab uh you and there's a drop down on the top so you'll see sure. more than just these first five images uh, let me just yeah there you go so that will give you the genres of paintings so uh, I work in a couple of different styles. So the first series are my abstract painting series. And this one, this bright one actually was featured uh, earlier this year, both on the Jumbotron in Times Square and um, also through MVVO Art. It was featured on the giant screens of the Oculus World Trade Center in May of this year. So that was very exciting uh, for me to see you know, digital versions of my art on two big landmarks uh, in New York City. And um, and then subsequently, um, I you know, I had, as I mentioned earlier, I had uh, a bunch of shows both in the Hamptons in New York and um, other, other places, both digital and uh, IRL. And most recently, my, uh, I had some ocean uh, inspired paintings that were featured in Paris at an exhibition um, for a climate change uh, a show. And this um, series, if you click on that, Greg, my Wall Street series, there'll be you know 15 or 20 paintings that will come up. Uh, yeah, if you go, go, go back uh, to the Wall Street, yeah, just click on that. And- um, Where do you see yeah, Wall, so Street Wall Street here? Yeah, it's, if you go, yeah, so if you go below the, abstract tab go to the next tab oh, yeah, okay. click on wall street series click on that link please yep yeah so this brings up um my uh, my paintings that are inspired by my trading day so um so just to give you an example the yellow this i, I have half a dozen uh, paintings so i have a brexit series that are in black and white. And Elena, for you guys over in um, the UK, I think this this was, it was quite a tumultuous time. So these black and white paintings, which I painted at the time, were really expressing 
um, the turbulence, the angst of the people that were going through what was at that time a very binary event. And there was so much uncertainty. There was political, economic, financial, social um, uncertainty. So this series of paintings really captured uh, it was my visceral response to what was going on. I was obviously in New York and seeing this from across the pond, but this was my interpretation of uh, a major event that was going on. Um, the other uh, series, uh, part of the series um, that I painted was the 0809 financial collapse. And if you scroll a little bit further down, Greg, you'll see some of those paintings. So, um, yeah, the, this red one, for example, this one actually won an award, um, but this is just, um, um, uh, yeah, I don't know if you can, yeah, thank you. Uh, this is called Wall Street Exuberance versus Uncertainty. It's the, this red one shows um, the uncertainty that uh, a Wall Street or any uh, a trader experiences during their trading day. So the colors are very bright, the very, um, the, there's a lot of, um, velocity and motion just in my brush strokes and what I'm trying to convey there is just the sense of excitement and uh, uncertainty that goes on behind the scenes and it doesn't matter if it's crypto trading or, or futures trading, options trading, uh, equities or bond trading. It's just uh, what I'm trying to capture is the emotions uh, underlying that. Um, the green painting to the left actually, these two are the, the first two that I minted and that was bull market. And again, that was expressing, you know, green for the US dollar, green for what my trading screen <laughs> looks like when the markets are green or the stock is green. Uh, again, this is a, a big 36 by 36 um, canvas. It's a uh, use oil and mixed media and um, you know, some acrylic. And I use a combination of um, brush strokes and squeegee, actually, this. This series was inspired by Gerhard Richter. I just absolutely love um, his, his work. And so this painting in particular was inspired by that. Um, the next two are really collages, um, so very different. Um, these are, uh, I got ripped out pages from the FT and the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, um, just uh, depicting the financial collapse. Again, this was a major, major, time uh, for all of us who lived through it uh the the uncertainty the the, the scariness you know every time the market uh, gyrations happened we were sitting there in front of our screens and it was just um kind of a crazy time but i i was trying to capture that moment uh, on canvas because uh it was for me it was just uh one way of expressing um, the stress and chaos that was happening around me. And uh, I just, it, it was a gr grounding experience for me. It's the way I could just uh, achieve some calm and peace and clarity. And I think more importantly, um, this was documenting, you know, major events on canvas. Um, so thank you for sharing those. I could go on and on, but okay. I don't know how much time we have. And if you want to just flip maybe to the um, the next series, which are the um, ocean inspired series. So yeah, this one. So these are um, in the summertime, I, I spend a lot of time at the beach and I'm outdoors. Um, I spend a lot of time, you know, I, I run and I'm very, I try to be as athletic as possible. So, and I find that going to the beach, just the, the ocean is really um, very inspiring to me. I'm very inspired by nature. And so this series was about, you know, the blues and greens are kind of the, the calm that, that I, I get from nature. And uh, I must say uh, during the pandemic, when the early days of the pandemic, I found this as a beautiful way to just provide, um, you know, peace and calm and serenity for myself as an artist. But then when I was sharing some of those images on Instagram, I got beautiful messages back from my followers, direct messages, comments saying, Lila, thank you so much for sharing um, some of your art with us. And this provided a moment of uplift. Um, this, these images provided a moment of serenity to us. 
And for me, that was um, that was so gratifying um, that you know one of my creations or some of my creations could offer a moment of peace or joy or uplift or serenity when you know we, we were all going through um, such a difficult time with, with so much uncertainty around us. So anyway, thank you for for um, sharing those images uh, on the screen. Great, Leila. I really love your work, by the way. It's so beautiful. It's, it's very contemporary abstract. And I, I see a lot of my stuff, too, in there. I, I just I love your work. Um, do you um, are you now putting these? Are you going to convert these into NFTs? I just wanted to ask. Yes, and thank you. And I love your work, too, Alicia. So thank you for the compliment. Uh, yes, that is the plan. And I've, I've just done it very slowly because, um, you know, I'm, I'm uh, I just want to do it slowly and thoughtfully and get feedback from my collectors and from the you guys from the community uh, and this whole blockchain and uh, you know crypto stuff is new to me so um, I really appreciate and I welcome all of the support that I can get in this journey and I'm absolutely happy to offer back to you whatever I can uh, absolutely to do that so thank I you think, I think it's a great idea to NFT uh, to mint them, I mean, I think I think it's a go, you know. But I like the fact that you're taking things slow. I did the same thing. I probably minted roughly about five at a time um, okay. until I got to uh, my collection. I think I have like 103. Greg, are you able to pull that up? My um, my uh, my website motleyeye.com, and then there's a link at the top that shows my OpenSea collection. Are we able to do that? Yeah, yeah sure. Let me uh, see one second. Okay, how do you spell that? Uh, it's M O T L E Y E Y E dot com. Okay. That's named after my first painting. You can just click out of that. Yeah. And then when you click out of that, it'll be on the top. Oh, well, there's my Wayfair. <laughs> there we go. Um, if you scroll up, go all the way to the top, it'll say click here for open CNFT platform. Oh. Uh, cookies. All right. That's you. How do we get to the NFT? Uh, open C? Let's see. All the way. All, all the way there, guys. There you go. Yes. Oh, very cool. Very cool. I did that so that I, I it's kind of like an easier thing, so just a, a something you can maybe do even with your uh, site as well. So these are just, this one's on secondary, actually, but I just wanted to, to show that, that you could actually do that, you know, with your website. You could put a link, like a little banner at the top, uh, open C, or uh, wearable collection. Um, just an idea, since, you know, you're new to NFTs, I think that's a pretty uh, great thing to do. So I just wanted to show that just so that people can, you know, it's just an idea, you know, uh, that way sometimes it's easier for people to just go to web, one website, kind of like a link tree where you go to a link tree and everything's right there. Um, so, yeah, so this is, uh, that's what I, that's all I really wanted to show, Greg. Thank you very much. And if you want to, you know. Terrific. I'll spend some time and, and go through your work. It looks beautiful. And thank you thank for doing you. that. So I'll check out OpenSea as well. Yeah, I have um, some other friends who've recommended OpenSea as well. So thank you for that. So everyone listening on Actually, uh, have, have we discussed previously, uh, this is uh, that uh, at Zoom we will finish in four minutes. We will start conversation about the surprise from Greg for everyone that everyone been waiting for the story about marketplace from Interpoin and how we gonna help every artist uh, to overcome some challenges. And now I would like to invite and reach back into the floor to talk with Greg together or maybe ask questions and discuss what is the technology, uh, what's happening with the technologies and what's happening with God's fees, how Intercoin can help all artists to overcome uh, different challenges. Greg, please. The floor is yours. Well, I just wanted to say a few things. Uh, I think this is, uh, Vic had a question in the Telegram. He's asking everyone, how do you plan to turn your art into NFTs? 
And that's, that's a, great a great question, Vic, for everybody who's watching on YouTube at the moment. If you want to have your voice heard, uh, click the link in the description under the, the video. Um, if you're watching this after, obviously the show's over, but every Wednesday we're doing the show live. So this is great. People can ask questions in the Telegram. People can ask questions in the Super Chats on, on YouTube, which you can see here. Uh, basically, um, anywhere that you are, uh, you could participate. So, I think, Vic, it's a great question if, if you're an artist and you want to create art, what can you do? And um, uh, we mentioned Intercoin Marketplace. I just wanted to quickly say Intercoin has already been following a pretty good roadmap. Uh, we started the Intercoin community in March of last year when the pandemic was actually coming up. Um, Everyone's sort of online, and uh, we started the Intercoin community, which you could see here. I definitely would love everyone to join. Um, if you're here on the call and you haven't joined yet the Intercoin community, I highly recommend that you do. Intercoin is all about community, and any questions that you have when the show is not happening, the best time to, the best way to ask them is on the forum. So just go to community.intercoin.org and please sign up. You're going to get badges. You're going to get NFTs pretty soon if you join the Intercoin community. And that's going to become very important because, you know, NFTs, I think the NFT world understands the uh, importance of being part of a community. And holding an NFT to some extent makes you part of that community and you can show it off in different places. So the Intercoin app is a natural sort of space on which you'd like to make that happen. Uh, if you're at a party, you can show off your NFTs. You can invite other people to join a community and so on. So see, as we're discussing all this stuff um, on the forum, this is where the conversation takes place for us. So real quick, so we honestly started that community. We launched this channel, which you're listening to right now. And we open source all our code on GitHub. Anytime you go to github.com slash intercoin, you could see the work ongoing, our development team and everything. Um, I was talking about auctions for NFTs, staking, and we're going to talk about NFT 2.0. So just last thing I want to mention is what's coming up. Intercoin token, by the way, is now listed on exchanges. So if you scroll up here, if you ever want to get the Intercoin token, you can get it on Uniswap. You can also get it on uh X Markets, which is a centralized exchange in case you don't want to pay all these fees. You can go ahead and do that here. Um, X Markets. And so um, these are the different ways that you can um, trade intercoin, uh, ITR token. Um, you could look at we're on coin market cap, coin tell, you know, everywhere, and we're also in the news. Uh, coming up, we're going to launch the Intercoin app, all right? I'm going to have to say in December because the way the development works, the Apple Store has to approve the app and so on. Uh, very likely, uh, you know, we still need to, development always takes a little longer than you think it would. So this year, we're launching the Intercoin app. It's going to let you join any community, start your own community if you already have NFTs. Or if you're an artist, you want to build your community, you'll be able to do that through this. And then this is where it gets really cool. Um, we're calling this NF Tree Mix. That's how you're supposed to pronounce it. Actually, uh, it's going to say NFT Remix. And if anyone's interested, I got um, we we got NFTRemix.com, .org, .net. Um, .com cost us about a thousand dollars. You know, domain names were the first NFTs. Uh, in the sense that when you buy a domain name, you can point it anywhere you want. And love those types of NFTs that you can actually interact with and change. Those types of NFTs, in my mind, are even more valuable than just to look at or to listen to because they're collaborative. And so NFT 2.0 is all about engaging with your fans and collaborating with your fans. So I'm going to talk about that um, in the next segment, but I just wanted to say that Intercoin is launching the Intercoin app and then Next month, what you can look forward to, and we can talk about this in the next segment, is having NFTs where your first, uh, let's say, Board Apes 1.0 was about people just buying the Board Ape and looking at it. 
and using it on their Twitter and so on. NFT 2.0, it's going to be about Bored Ape 2.0. You can dress the Bored Ape. You can uh, collaborate with fashion designers to dress the ape. You can have animators animate the ape, and you can basically remix all kinds of things. Here is an NFT platform. It's pretty innovative. Uh, one of our clients uh, came to us in the summer. They're going to be at Art Basel, and I just wanted to give a shout out. Uh, Token Society, they're going to have essentially uh, showcasing different artists. It's coming soon at the events. You're going to be able to buy them. And so as we're building this for them, a lot of the um, things come up with gas fees, and we're going to talk about that. But basically, it's much better to pay the gas when you're actually going to buy the thing, right? As opposed to pay the gas anyway. So that's why I think, Alicia, what you're saying this, basically it's better to have um, OpenSea minted on demand, lazy minting versus minting like Rarible, like right away, right? Is that what you're referring yes. to? Yes. I, I like the fact that you could just, you, you pay for the gas the first uh, mint, and then after that, um, the collector actually pays the gas. And if you price your art accordingly, um, which I, I usually like to do, I kind of give them a little bit of wiggle room. So basically, because you know how gas fees have been, but for once that gets all figured out, and for once the intercoin uh, marketplace is up, those gas fees will be uh, very minimal, right, Greg? They will be very minimal. Um, because on Ethereum, the gas fees are very high. You know, I'm a straight shooter. And sometimes I th say things that are like, contrary to, you know, you say, oh, the emperor has no clothes type of thing, right? So I say, I don't know why people use Ethereum. I mean, there's so many other uh, great uh, fast networks out there, including Polygon, including XDAI chain, which hardly anybody uses, really cheap also. Binance Smart Chain is very popular. It's got pancake swaps, arguably got more volume now than Uniswap. Um, and so, you know, you've got these long tails, like f almost free, some of these Matic, Polygon Matic. Basically, what, what is interesting is that you can literally um, mint on these platforms for free. That's what they say. You can mint it for free, including things like Unstoppable Domains, uh, which, um, you know, no renewal fees. And now you can mint for free on Polygon Matic. So essentially, um, a lot of these NFTs are moving to these chains. I have no idea why somebody would want to pay Ethereum miners exorbitant fees uh, just to do things. But having said that, because OpenSea has started on Ethereum, because some of the early marketplaces were there, that's where everybody is at the moment. It's a network effect. And so, okay, so miners, Ethereum miners, enjoy your time while you can, um, you know, collecting gas fees. But if that's going to happen, people are going to try to optimize their smart contracts. You know, I was on call with a client today actually talking about how we can save them gas fees by minting only when you need. And to do that, there's something called essentially um, meta transactions. OK, so meta transactions are something um, where you let's say the owner of the NFT, the author of the NFT rather, the creator, they uh, pre-sign a transaction that authorizes someone to buy it for a certain price. That kind of signature of authorizing, it happens only um, with it happens without having to post to the blockchain. So literally, like here's an example of social apps that we build, right? You can talk to people, and you can do a lot of things with our social apps from Cubix. So one thing that you can do is here. I'm going to log out. Is you can actually log in using a wallet. So when you log in using a wallet, and you won't see this on Instagram, but I've got uh, MetaMask popping up here. You see that in the YouTube. You're signing a, a little phrase, and you pre-sign it, and boom, you're logged in. You've proven to the site that you are this person. Welcome to Yang 2020. This app will help you connect with friends, discover new people with common interests, and much more. Let's get started. So then you, let's say, set up your name. You uh, set up your picture that you'd like to uh, to have. And then what happens is I'm going to just say, let's say I, I'm going to say it's Stacy, even though um, Stacy, sorry, I'm going to use your likeness over here. This is your NFT I'm using just for the demo purpose. Uh, you could choose your location. These are all kinds of things we've already built. But the thing is, you've just 
connected using your wallet. The more items you choose, the more people you can meet. And the wallet's under your control, so you don't have to even um, you don't have to even uh, log in with Google or use Facebook, right? They don't control your identity. You control your identity. So you log in with one of these wallets. And then the next thing you do is you can actually meet people in the community over common interests, right? So I was just talking today to the, uh, you know, actually yesterday with the forward party, which I'm going to talk about later, because uh, I like to do public announcements, right? Then there's no insider trading about Intercoin if it's all public like this thing. So I could publicly right now say that we're talking to the forward party. Uh, we could maybe make a forward coin. We'll see. But the thing is that um, forward party is a decentralized party. They need to organize people and we need to know what people support. UBI, this or that. So are you a community organizer? Are you, uh, what are you interested in, right? So you select these things and then you meet people. You're able to meet other people around these interests. So this is how the intersection of Web3 sign-ins and community can be. If you're part of the Board Apes Club, you can actually later go to the Intercoin uh, community and find each other and talk. And um, we have the technology to do so. Hey, I'm uh, an artist with a computer. I build apps for a living, right? For example, boom. And then suddenly you're able to do all kinds of things with other people. Click here to invite some of your friends to join us. Right. So that's, and the reason that the computer is reading this is because if I was in Japan, it would speak Japanese to me. See, so everything is also internationalized and works all over. So that's what Intercoin has, uh, Cubix, my first company, has built, and now we're extending it. Uh, you can have your own coin, right? You can invite friends and earn tokens in the app, but then you can also earn NFTs. And all of this working together is going to help communities. So my point is, if you're an artist, we're going to help you launch your own community. And you're going to let your community talk, discuss things like, you know, watch here we had Andrew Yang debates. You can discuss, you can have conversations about um, real life uh, events, current events happening, like with the Forward Party, right? Rohingya Project, which we're going to talk about in another uh, show. And then finally, uh, you can even have commerce. So whereas currently the commerce that we had was about um, using the banking system, right? So you have like you pay $1 using the banking system. Um, we're going to hook up tokens, USDT and others. And that's where things are going to get interesting. So NFT 2.0 is about having the creators start to collaborate with their buyers. And w imagine what kind of things you can create together as a community. So that's all. Just wanted to kind of um, give a little taste about the Intercoin um, NFT 2.0 project. And we're going to be calling it NFT Remix because if you say NFT Remix, there's an uh, idea of a tree. And why is there a tree? I'll get into that some other time. So Elena, I give it back to you. I just wanted to kind of uh, explain how the art is going to turn it into a community uh, activity rather than just a one-way publishing. So hopefully we can have that revolution happen on uh, Intercoin's marketplace. Wonderful. Such a great news, Greg. Thank you very much. Sure. And uh, now we have time for uh, questions from our guests on the call. If anyone wants to unmute uh, themselves and uh, ask uh, questions to our artists or uh, Greg, uh, because uh, for some kind of reason, technical difficulties we experience in our other speakers uh, not on the call anymore. And uh, we're looking forward to hear you. Vic, you had, was your question answered? Was I able to answer your question? Thanks for asking, by the way. I don't know if your mic is working. Vic was in the chat room asking it. So I just wanted to quickly okay. uh, ask, so about the gas fees, Elena, um, are we going to have the segment on gas fees or is it, uh, or you want to talk more about yes, Yes, we can talk about gas fees now, how you can overcome actually the gas fees. 
uh, because uh, several uh, artists and communities uh, struggled with it. <laughs> and, uh, okay, well, I'm a straight shooter. Do you have any solutions for that? Of course. I mean, listen, I'm a straight shooter. I'll just tell you that, first of all, like I said, I don't know why anybody uses Ethereum, except for the fact that it has these marketplaces on it. And there's already like a bit of a, um, a network effect. Okay. I remember speaking with this guy from the Interledger protocol. Um, his name is Stefan Thomas. He used to be um, the CTO of Ripple. And he went on to found Coil. And he founded, more importantly, perhaps, Interledger Protocol. Coil is a company that implements Interledger Protocol. And so Ripple is, you know, a lot of the people from Ripple, just like with PayPal Mafia and others, went on to found other companies, right? Like uh, Stellar and so on. So that idea of Interledger, I remember Stefan Thomas was telling me, like, the companies, the credit card companies like Visa used to be proud of how many stores would accept them, right? And they used to say something like, Visa, everywhere you want to be. Okay, that used to be the commercial. And it was something like this, for example, you know. Right? Anyway, everywhere you want to be. It was a slogan, and that was about the network effect. But once you build bridges between blockchains like Interledger Protocol does, or like the Intercoin with the Interswaps, right? Um, what's going to happen is that it won't matter anymore if you're on Ethereum or whatever. You can burn your NFT on Ethereum and mint it on like Polygon or Solana. So it'll kind of be agnostic. I mean, Intercoin's even talking about having um, interoperability and sw interswaps with things like... Um, uh, city coins. Okay, so if you want to do, for example, cross uh, chain solutions, uh, we talk about how exactly it's going to happen. Trustless trading. Um, I can also give a shout out to um, uh, the guys at Pulse Chain. Uh, so Richard Hart, who founded Hex, they're now talking about running another uh, low gas fee thing called Pulse Chain. The difference between Pulse Chain and everything is that they decided they're going to fork Ethereum. So think of it like Ethereum forked from Ethereum Classic. Pulse Chain forks from Ethereum. So all of the smart contracts that you know and love are going to have the same address, the same state, same NFTs, but it's going to run on this faster chain. Mostly nobody's going to hear about it. Well, not nobody, but relatively to Ethereum, uh, things are going to happen on the Ethereum chain. It's going to diverge from this pretty fast. So you're going to own an NFT on this chain that's, you know, a snapshot of what it was and be on Ethereum. But this chain's cheaper, faster, right? And so in typical, you know, Richard Hart style, uh, people indirectly invested in it by sending their money to some address. And then, boom, they got airdropped some, you know, some uh, Pulse chain. But the point is that Richard Hart in one of his um, uh, live streams was talking about just recently, he has never seen a trustless cross-chain bridge. Well, Intercoin is building a trustless cross-chain bridge. And if we do that, uh, we can move your NFTs to a faster chain. But I'm going to be like a straight shooter. Um, blockchain is super overkill for non-fungible tokens. There's no reason why non-fungible tokens should even live on a blockchain. The reason that they do is because of historical accident. It's mostly because fungible very, very divisible tokens like Bitcoin, right? Um, had the blockchain, right? They pioneered the idea of using a blockchain, a timestamp server, as Satoshi used to call it, uh, in order to power it. Now, Bitcoin and Cardano and others are based on something called UTXO, unspent transaction outputs. So I'm not going to go into what that is, except to say that everything here is sort of intertwined so you can't really even partition the network into like shards and that keeps it from ever being like really scalable um that's not always necessarily true because cardano is able to do a lot of things in parallel but at the same time um it's it's a blockchain okay so everything uh 
has to be on the same consensus, on the same chain. Uh, Polkadot and other things have parachains. It's it's more of a federated approach, just like Intercoin. Um, but I would say that the future is lying with things like Holochain, Intercoin's uh, protocol in the future, and just things you're used to. Like if you've ever used BitTorrent, you know, you know what it's like to not have a bottleneck, right? You never have a central point in BitTorrent. In fact, most protocols on the internet have no central point. The web, HTTP, right? If you have double the number of computers, you're going to have many more conversations between those computers. If you double the number of humans on the planet, they're going to have conversations. And there's no question about how many conversations can humanity support per second, right? There's no limit because there's no bottleneck. So blockchain, there is a bottleneck, and the bottleneck typically is, you know, it's here, right? Um, the bottleneck is with the blockchain. It's this. All transactions in the world have to go through a single computer. And crypto's got to move beyond blockchains. Uh, that's because if you ever look around and you see people actually, like, going to the restaurant, are they paying with crypto? No. Um, when people are voting, are they voting with crypto? No. Uh, when they have a corporate organization chart or they have any sort of things, smart contracts have been around for six, seven years. Why aren't people using smart contracts for everything? Because they're so dog slow. Um, and even with Binance Smart Chain and Solana, they have so much unused capacity. But I bet you that when people start using it, it's going to fill up real quick. And even if it's proof of stake or whatever, storing every single state of every single thing in the world on a data structure is just not the right thing to do. And so we need to go to the roots of the internet and how the internet has no single point, no central point. It all can route around and so on. And these all of these local communities can do their own thing. So that's Intercoin's approach. Intercoin, well, I'll talk about another, um, in another show, is talking about crypto must move beyond peer to peer because we've got to serve entire communities, right? Communities can have things like their own currency, fungible tokens, but they can also pay in that currency. They can pay out. They can run contests. Imagine having a contest where you can actually reward people for helping your community, right? And then people can make decisions together in the organic governance, right? So governance, roles, permissions, represented by NFTs, secure elections, right? If you're a member, you can vote and you can base your decisions on real data that's collected and you can look at the blockchain and you can analyze the data and you can have many tools. Uh, that's the beauty of it. The data belongs to us all. It doesn't belong to MasterCard. It doesn't belong to Macy's. It belongs to us, right? So we could actually see it. It doesn't belong to the Chinese government, to Amazon only. So that way we can make, make decisions about, inform decisions about what our community is going to do. If we move beyond blockchains, there's not going to be a centralized bottleneck. We're going to go back to internet protocols like HTTP and so on. So the thing is, if you have a coin, you're trying to solve the double spend problem, it turns out it's much easier to solve it when the coin's not divisible. All you've got to do is track the latest owner of the coin. It's a much easier problem than this UTXO stuff uh, with uh, Bitcoin and with balances on Ethereum because you can't divide it. So really, a coin is just an object that moves around. So inner coin protocol is going to be like a supernatural fit for NFTs. And you can think of NFTs as just like a file on the Internet, right? Um, BitTorrent is constantly serving like a file on the internet, right? And um, there are all these new things like uh, DAT protocol, which is now called uh, HyperCore. And what it talks about is they create these swarms that just look at certain files and they uh, store uh, the latest uh, version of the file. It's like GitHub meets uh, BitTorrent, okay? So you can have a decentralized system where you essentially store a file. IPFS can store files, right? And there's modules that let you uh, evolve the files in time, uh, similar end result. Then you've got the MadeSafe project. MadeSafe is, I'm in awe of these people. They've been working for literally 15 years on this. And they are probably the most advanced design of any, uh, way more design, way more advanced than blockchains, okay? 
uh, when they come out, it's going to be a pleasure to store files on their system because there will be no central anything. It'll be completely autonomous. You just run a client, store something, and it's a piece of something, and you don't know what you're storing. But you're securing the network, and you're mining or you're farming a uh, made safe coin. So here's a plug to them. Um, but ultimately, you're going to have systems. Uh, you know, Hollow Chain is another example. Hollow Chain, the hot token went up early this year. I don't know how decentralized they are, but they certainly, um, if they do achieve true decentralization, um, they're going to be more decentralized than blockchains, okay? Because again, uh, there's essentially non-divisible coins can be hosted on these things. So NFTs are non-divisible coins. Uh, if you're able to envision beyond the blockchain, you're going to see so many different protocols and so many different things that can be used for NFTs. So to me, this whole craze of artificial scarcity comes from Bitcoin. It comes from the idea that you need to restrict the supply of something, right, for people to uh, pay more for it over time. And while that is interesting, most things in the world work the opposite way, especially technology. Technology is supposed to bring down the cost, right? What we're doing right now with Telegram would have been impossible 20 years ago. It would have been very costly to run a voice chat with so many people internationally. The reason it went to zero is because voice over IP commoditized the, the pipes. You can now uh, send your signals all around the internet and they route around any sort of pipes that charge you too much money. And so if you could do that with voice over IP, imagine what you could do that with anything. So the idea that you know things go down in price um, is even said by uh, venture capitalists like Albert Wenger talks about the world after capital. So he finally uh, published the book, it looks like. It's completely open source. There's no restriction. There's no scarcity. And uh, the book is about how computers have made it so that each copy has a marginal cost of pretty much zero. If Tesla figures out a better way to do self-driving cars, a better algorithm, it can download it to every Tesla car. And so the idea is that if you have open source software, right, the idea is that you don't have scarcity. Anyone can use it for anything. And so if you're a digital content provider, I'll talk about this some other time, but a digital content provider needs a way to monetize themselves. But the question is, does there have to be artificial scarcity? If millions of people want to use your digital content, if you're a journalist and you wrote an article that millions of people want to read, the question is, why can't you just let the millions of people read it? Why, can you, why are you only allowing 100 people to read it? And so that idea of digital media and content is an interesting question. I'll talk about economics on the internet some other time. We'll bring on guests, but like the current economics on the internet are paywalls, New York Times, you've probably seen this a lot, Wall Street Journal, The Economist, they all have paywalls, they all have subscriptions. That's the current model and is driven by the profit motive and answering to Wall Street uh, you know, shareholders. And um, it has its drawbacks because you see our society is basically balkanized into left versus right, you know, people, um, you, you cannot have a middle of the road um, publication so much because people want to read certain straw men of the other side, uh, whichever side that is. Uh, they feel comfort in a tribe. And that's how our society becomes when you're driven by advertising dollars and you're driven by subscription dollars. Compare that to something like Wiki News, because I always like to talk substance, not just say, you know, pontificate. Here's Wiki News. No profit motive, completely collaborative, right? And every, you can even see the selection of articles is completely different than the US centric stuff that you would probably never read uh, in the world. You know, you never even know this stuff. So I don't know, uh, British Columbia evacuated amid massive storm. This article has been crowdsourced and people have debated and discussed uh, issues about it. Uh, so that's the idea is that if there is controversy, it's settled in the background. So the public is not exposed to one sided narrative. How different that is, how different than Twitter or any one sided media type of thing. Um, if, you, if you got Elon Musk with his, uh, you know, uh, millions, tens of millions of followers, right? You got here, Elon Musk, right? If he goes and, and tweets about any asset, any crypto asset, it's going to skyrocket in price, right? Anything he tweets. Uh, it's going to just reach tons of people. And that's sort of a, let's call it a um, private ownership approach, right? Elon Musk owns his audience privately. It's a form of capital. 
and it's a form of capital he can convert to actual economic outcomes. And vice versa, you can buy followers with money. But if you go back to Wiki News, right, totally different reality. There are no heroes. There are no celebrities here. It's just the content. Content's hyperlinked. It's very useful. It's hyperlinked to stories about Canada. It's hyperlinked to everything. And the quality is a very different quality. There's no one-sidedness here. There's no sensationalism so much. It's not the point. And so the news could come out maybe a few hours afterwards. However, it's much more balanced. So my point is the economic system determines what happens and the economic system of NFTs um, is right now based on scarcity. It's based on, so, so New York Times is not based on scarcity. You can have as many people reading New York Times as you want, but you have to pay for it, right? That's subscription. Or you can have as many people reading as you want, but you have advertising. Those models are not dependent on scarcity. If anything, there's click, uh, there is click fraud, right? And people pretend to have more accounts than they should. And, and Twitter has more accounts that are fake and bots, and they welcome that because they get more venture capital. So there's you know, failure on the other side. Too many accounts. Um, so the idea of people managing their accounts and having all this thing, my company, Cubix, is talking about monetizing things without scarcity. In fact, the very premise, and I'll just say this, the very premise of uh, why this can work is because there's a near zero marginal cost to copying what works. And that's how technology is able to progress. Technology doesn't progress because of AI right now. Maybe 20 years from now it could. But right now technology progresses because humans find a better algorithm. Humans find a better data set, whatever. And then what they do is they take the old one and they essentially release 2.0 and 3.0 and people upgrade to the new application, right? And that's how the whole thing works. But the cost of actually making the copy, that's the smallest cost right? It's smaller than your iPhone. It's smaller literally than it costs like less than a penny to create a copy. And that's how all these things work. That's how Facebook can have one engineer per million people. And of course, the other thing is you can reuse everything. You can like remix. And that's why you have the NFT remix uh, website. So I'm going to talk about all that stuff later. But my point is right now, when you have an artwork, would you want to have as many people in the world see it as possible? Or would you want to keep it restricted for the um, same reason that Ivy League schools are restricted, right? For the prestige. And so we have Ivy League school um, uh, scandal, right? We have literally people trying, even even uh, celebrities trying to bribe their way, their you know kids' way into these Ivy League schools. Why do you need to get into Ivy League schools? Wikipedia is free for all. You can learn so much, right? The internet's free for all. Why do you need this scarcity of going in a specific school? Well, it's a prestige, right? It's a network effect of being in a certain milieu, of a certain uh, growing up, knowing people in your formative years. And then you can call on these people later and like they're in, you know, top positions and they can all help each other. So wouldn't it be nice if Intercoin or Cubics or the rest of the space created alternatives to what is institutions and created decentralized alternatives. And so these alternatives exist. Uh, Clay Shirky, guy who you may not know, uh, gave a talk about institutions versus collaboration. And this was back in, I don't know, this is like 2010. Very interesting TED talk. I highly recommend people listen to Clay Shirky. He and other people back then were talking about Web 2.0 and how collaboration helps you know user generated content and remixing, maybe people remember the Creative Commons and the remixes, right? And the, uh, I forgot what you call it, but mashups, right? Mashups and all these kinds of things on YouTube. That's a creative thing where no one owns a specific thing. And not many people know this, but if you're like a fan of Twilight, okay? And you do a fanfic, right? You could be writing fan fiction about something without permission. And uh, when I first saw um, Fifty Shades of Grey, how many people know where Fifty Shades of Grey actually comes from? Uh, where does the story come from for Fifty Shades of Grey? You know? Anybody have an idea? Tell us. <laughs> Fifty Shades of Grey was actually based on a fanfic of Twilight. 
when I first saw it, I'm like, I, I figured it out before knowing this. I was like, wait a second. This guy is basically exactly like a vampire who said, you know, has like lives alone and, and is super, except being super strong, he's super rich, right? And this girl discovers him and they have their secret thing, right? Going on. It's like exactly the same. Well, it turns out, yes. Basically, it's just Twilight with more S and M. It's an adult Twilight, and it's based on literally, uh, where is it? A fan fiction thing. Okay, that was uh, written by someone. Um, so, Smash Pictures responded to the lawsuit by issuing a counterclaim, stating that much or all of the Fifty Shades material was part of the public domain because it was originally published in various venues as a fan fiction based on the Twilight series. Literally, a fan of Twilight series wrote sort of a book and then the movies and everything were based on it okay and that's kind of very interesting because that's what fans can do right a lot of times uh things become bigger than the original uh thing than the original um universe you know harry potter universe or whatever and so copyright has to battle with that question of of scarcity copyright doesn't enforce scarcity but copyright does enforce uh royalties right and so nfts would be interesting if artists said you know what i want the widest possible audience to see my stuff i don't want to be an ivy league school i want to be wikipedia i want to be you know this thing that gives to the world and then so people can build on it and remix it and create whatever just like 50 shades of gray was created from twilight um who knows what could be created and so nft mix remix and nft 2.0 is about that if you have board apes club great for you and you've made a lot of money and if you made the first uh the first episode the first uh season of a netflix, netflix show great, great for you, you. What, what if, if your, your second, second season could involve uh students from a uh, graphic arts school or fit you know fashion and they could collaborate with you on costume design and all kinds of stuff right wouldn't that be cool and you could do that with nfts so I'm just letting everyone know it's like our current, you can feel it, like search yourself, right? Our current society is based on a lot of it, the profit motive and a claim to yourself, right? But what if you let the content that you create and the software programs, the online journalism and the digital content, music and everything else be front and center? What if the heroes gradually fade away in the same way that the original team that created Ethereum Right is now not as prevalent at, as, as front and center as Mark Zuckerberg, who created Facebook like 14, 15 years ago. So like the idea is that with Wall Street earnings, you keep having these CEOs that have to centralize everything because they have to satisfy their shareholders and the profit motive. If they don't, they're going to get replaced. Whether that's advertising or whatever, they have to keep innovating. That's why Mark Zuckerberg wants the metaverse to be all around Facebook. You know that he's not going to like just give it out give it out and like you know here's open source we don't care you know we're not gonna make any money obviously not because they're a company um similarly as an artist you want acclaim you want fame you want recognition that's all good but at some point let's say you have tons of fame you have tons of recognition people are finding you on the street it becomes annoying you have paparazzi everywhere right at some point you start wishing that like your harry potter universe just goes on by itself and you can have a family right so there are diminishing returns to fame. There's are diminishing returns to money. And at some point, when it becomes bigger than you, when Amazon becomes bigger than Jeff Bezos, the question is, can a decentralized version of that be given to the people? Can the people own the board apes? And can they remix it? And can they make it something that is owned by the people? Right. That, to me, those are questions that I want to explore. And that's what Intercoin explores with the fungible tokens and the coins, right? By the people, for the people. But that's, I'm starting to look at NFT space the same way. I'm starting to think, what if there were no heroes? What if there was no Elon Musk? And all the content was just the primary thing, right? Because these pieces, if somebody made this article, somebody argued about its content, but at the end of the day, I don't care who it is. Nobody cares who it is. It's the article that matters, right? And so all these people who are signing their names on the uh, talk page and all the people that you view the history of all, who are these people? Lively ratification, whatever. This is a different world, but it's a world in which individual voices maybe start the conversation, but then the conversation takes place, it gets bigger and bigger, right? 
And so the individual voice may always be around to sort of be there, but then they can retire, they can have a life, and this thing can live on. Like Wikipedia, you know, I don't know what Jimmy Wells is doing these days, but I use Wikipedia all the time. So that's what I want. I want a society that has this at least as an alternative that's just as prevalent, right, as the Twitters of the world, as the, uh, what do they call it? Influencers, right? The talking heads, the, the people that you listen to on the TED podcast, whatever. The Gary Vaynerchuk's, you know. Shout out to Gary Vaynerchuk, but honestly, like, I'd rather people discuss substance. And that's just how I am, and different people are different. Uh, but I'd like to see more of this because I think there's not enough of this. I just wanted to open up to everybody uh, after this monologue and kind of just ask, has this inspired you in any way to sort of, you know how in our society we have now conversations about privilege. We have conversations about Me Too. We have conversations about um, women in the corporate uh, sphere uh, and moving sort of from perhaps family life more into corporate. And now people moving away from corporate because they had a taste of work from home, right? Remote. So my, we have those conversations, but almost never do we have the economic conversation about what economic system is driving the very different attitudes you have. So if you look inside yourself, how much do you want fame? How much do you want fortune, right? And at some point, is any of it gonna be enough where you say, you know what, I want to turn this over gradually to my biggest supporters, to my, you know, and let them drive the project. Like, that's what I just wanted to ask artists here. Like, what do you feel? Do you ever feel as an artist that you could give up your baby to be, <laughs> to be um, changed, perhaps, by the community into all these different versions, tree of different possibilities? So that, I just want to leave it out there and ask everybody what they think about that. Actually, we had a conversation about changing the of arts with Leila. And Leila, maybe you can tell a little bit more to the audience uh, about your plans to co collaborate with the young artists. Well, you know, uh, Leila and I were, were talking about, um, you know, because my, my art is, is traditional, right? It's a traditional abstract or representational. And when she asked me what I thought of the idea, and by the way, Greg, I thought that your your whole explanation earlier was, was fabulous. It was so insightful uh, to thank listen you. to. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, obviously it's a new concept, but what I shared with Elena would be, you know, if I could perhaps think about collaborating maybe with a digital artist and then do an overlay, you know? Um, it, it's the, the, the possibilities are endless and you know I have another friend who's in fashion and um, he just started to create NFTs so collaborate you can you can collaborate across um, uh, disciplines uh, and you know this could translate to movie sets to uh, books to journalism you can you know this it, I, I think this opens the field wide Elena. <laughs> so um, you know I, I don't know what, what the, um, the sort of how this is going to evolve but I can just see that, that this is you know very exciting and have you Greg talked to any of the board apes um, the other owners I know there was one on our call uh, what, what is the reception for you know, from that community about dressing up the apes. You know, we uh, haven't even started, started to reach out to them. Um, okay. If David was here, Stacey could tell you, we have some celebrities who are interested in having their own NFT projects, but I don't do anything like cookie cutter. Uh, if I look at a space and I can see that I can add to it, that's why I feel I'm an artist, right? I don't necessarily draw the things, but I feel like I change entire spaces with my ideas, right? So that's why I like to say I'm an artist with a computer. Yeah, cool. And, you know, we, I saw the, uh, Elena knows that with the Van Gogh exhibit, the installation art is, is I think it's an example of how, you know, all, all of these um, are, are constantly changing and they're, they're drawing from so many different technologies, right? Um, so audio, video, music, dance, and they're all collaborating and they're creating something uh, something that's bigger than the sum of the parts. So and I think on a conceptual level, 
I think, right, that's basically what you're talking about, is you're talking about individual creatives collaborating to create uh, another universe, another alternate reality that is bigger than the sum of all of these. And, you know, the, the company that's done this historically successfully is Disney. Disney was very early with their animation to do this, but I think what your, uh, as I understand it, this gives individual creatives the ability to collaborate like that. Is that correct, Greg? That's exactly right. And we see a corporate version of this with the metaverse when, you know, they say you can live in the metaverse, you can sort of make it your own, right? You can create a version of your house and everything like that. But there's sort of this idea of scarcity and like Minecraft was an idea of a metaverse without scarcity. It was very long ago it was launched, but it was really cool because anybody can just run Minecraft, right? And create their own things. And there's no token necessarily. There's no, you know, there's no thing that you have to make money with. Once you've bought Minecraft, you can just explore and create and share. Whereas like, I'm pretty sure that with Facebook, there's going to be, you know, limited edition this and buy that and outfit your house with, you know, even though there's absolutely no cost to creating billions of copies of something cool, right, in everyone's home, but they're going to make like a restriction because that's what software company for profit companies do, you know? Right. And I think this that, that, that you, you might solve for that equation with, um, with, with royalties. So instead of making it free, maybe the initial collaboration and then have some kind of small royalty stream. Uh, again, I'm just thinking out loud, you know, um, but I think that that way you could um, achieve what you're saying and then have a, a small economic kind of a trail, trailer, right? To, the, yes. to some of the participants or for a finite time. You could say that this, this exists for X amount of time. You know, be it three months, six months, one year, um, or into perpetuity. Um, you can structure the royalties or not. <laughs> well, make it completely free or exactly. Or, you know, yeah. You can structure. You can make all kinds of things, and like, basically. You know, the, the, they make the joke about Mickey Mouse. Like the reason the copyright is so big is because of Disney lobbying, right? He's got all these Disney characters. And remember, Disney Studios also bought the Marvel Universe characters, right? right? And they got all these different interesting ideas and universes. And Star Wars, I think, might be owned by Disney as well. I think it is. Um, Disney Plus, I think, has Star Wars. It has all kinds of things. So Disney Plus is one way to animate, right? But of course... Uh, you know, the idea that Mickey with the black hands is in public domain, but Mickey with the white gloves is not or whatever it is. You know what I mean? All the ideas like that. Um, what is that copyright public domain? What if Disney could go beyond its outdated 100 year old, you know, idea of restricting everybody from using Mickey Mouse? What if Disney said, OK, we're going to do middle ground. We're going to go to 10,000 students around the country. Right. And we're going to mint 10,000 like licenses to animate Mickey from animation studios, right? Um, they're not owned by Disney. It's not a top-down approach. Disney does not set the agenda. So are you going to get, you know, Mickey Mouse, uh, you know, craps in the bathroom? Yes. You're, you're going to get, you know, <laughs> uh, Mickey Mouse, the Mickey, the pedophile mouse bear, you know, yes. You're going to get all kinds of crap. Uh, and that's what you get with user generated uh, content. However, you have to think about two things. One is that it's all out there and linked to each individual. So if you have the people doxed in the beginning, right, it's kind of hard to divest yourself of the reputation that you messed up Disney's account of character, right? And you made that one NFT. So people are going to think twice about doing it if they're not anonymous. The second thing is that Disney doesn't have to promote anything out of those 10,000 NFTs, but the winners of the contest, the ones that make the best Mickey Mouse uh, concepts that they haven't even thought of, right? It could be spun into a movie. I mean, literally, like Steve Urkel from Family Matters was a one-time recurring character, right? Zork from Orca, Robin Williams was a one-time recurring character. Even Fo it was on the show where Fonz, the, the whatever, the Fonzarelli, that guy, was a one-time recurring character that became a guy, right? 
he started where Robin Williams got his start work from work versus the funds or whatever so like you never know you got a spin-off thing you never know so if you are a show on netflix and you got canceled your fans can go ahead and and take over the the show and that's the other thing is that like right now we live in a world where scarcity is enforced and controlled like i want to i want two things okay i want uh two shows to come back one is called limitless with <laughs> i don't know if everyone remembers it was a nice movie and a lot of people wanted a new season of this. I'm sure there's other shows. And then the other one is The Tick. I mean, The Tick is such a nice parody of um, of superhero movies. Why did they have to cancel it every single time? Uh, this guy has no luck, Ben Edlund. But um, there, there are cult followings of this, right? And there's even, like, cars, like this car from, uh, what's it called? Pebble Beach, um, uh, 2011. What is it called? Um, Cadillac uh, CL. You look at this car, I mean, it's honestly, the only place I've ever seen this car is in the uh, Entourage movie. But I don't know if anyone's ever uh, seen it. USA, this is Stephanie. Car. Hey, this is uh, Robert. I'd like to get up to 30% off my auto insurance. Wait, By the way, this, it, what we just saw is all about the economic system, right, of the internet. It's the ads. Anyway, that is a Cadillac CL. The Cadillac CL is a convertible with suicide doors, meaning it opens a... Uh, fabulously in all directions uh, i'll just show you this this is the um cadillac cl very nice uh, front in my opinion and then uh it's essentially like old style there we go that's how it opens up right you can get in but this car was never built and i dare you to find any bad reviews of this everyone's like i want this car when is it coming out for 10 years people say this and cadillac's like nope so like the idea of course hardware is hard to make but software you know, digital content, movies, shows. Like, shows are not easy to, you know, to finance. But if people can finance projects and they can own collectively the project as, as like, a community, that's what it's about, um, in my opinion. That could, Mickey Mouse crowdfunding, uh, I, you know, concepts on Mickey Mouse, re, re mixing Mickey Mouse, I think that could lead to a lot more for Disney than just keeping... Mickey Mouse and, you know, Sony Records keeping, like, a songwriter from writing songs or performing just because, like, they're trying to, like, restrict. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. So can I just segue for a quick moment? I, I don't know how much time we have, but I see uh, my friend Dan Taylor just joined us. And, hey, Dan, I don't know how long you've been listening, but he uh, specifically has... Um, a, a question that he has asked to me about the uses for of NFTs in real estate. So again, sorry to switch subjects, but if you can spend a few minutes for just for Dan, I, I just talked to him briefly about title search, but if you can speak to that, uh, I think that might be helpful for him. <laughs> so, or if you want to do that offline, that's fine too, Greg. No, that's fine. I would love to. Come on up and say whatever you like. Um, if you have a mic. I think he's on mute. I think you have to invite him to speak. No, I, no, everyone's, um, wait a moment. Do we need yes. to invite people to speak? There it goes. Yeah. Hi guys. Hello. I've, I've hey never Dan. done this. <laughs> hey, how are you? I've never done Telegram. Uh, whatever this is before, which is quite exciting. Great. Me awesome. neither. Yeah. <laughs> um, Thank you for we, joining. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. It's uh, wonderful to be here. I'm really excited about the space going forward uh, in terms of, you know, connecting the virtual world with the physical world and especially, you know, millennia proof and proven assets that have been around for obviously millennia that are income producing and tying that up with you know, the virtual, you know, backed by blockchain or smart contracts recorded on blockchain with um, NFTs, tokens, whatever you want to call them, as a medium for exchange of shares within those assets with a right to certain income. That really excites me going forward. Um, <clears throat> so that we can hopefully create our own, you know, like an exchange, like you have a real, real estate investment trust that's backed by uh, a listed exchange. You know, I'd love to create an exchange. It's a private exchange in our own community 
and so that enables the small guy to get involved in larger real estate transactions that are all income producing and um, that either they don't have the time, they don't have the inclination, the knowledge, effort or experience to do so. That's what really kind of excites me about this space. The, the ability for the everyday man to get involved in things they would never be able to. And as a community, as a collective, as a collaboration, that's really kind of what excites me and love the space. So really, I'm a student, want to learn, want to suck it all up. I'm like a sponge just now. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. That's really awesome. Thank you, Dan, for coming. Uh, we also uh, done it from UK and we plan to meet uh, up uh, in London at some point, but never had a chance. Uh, then we planning to run a separate event uh, dedicated for real estate and uh, the uh, real estate community all over the world uh, is very uh, keen on blockchain and building of uh, different technologies, but unfortunately, until up now, uh, we have we had so many different uh, challenges with uh, governmental bodies uh, in UK and in Europe. Uh, and as far as I know, um, I've been working on real estate blockchains and uh, tokens uh, for several years, uh, and uh, we were not able to end of get through <laughs> challenges but uh, i'm sure that we would have a different uh, event dedicated deliberately for real estate and to answer the company. Your questions as then to coin yes uh because uh Just you probably uh, joined uh, a bit later uh at the beginning of the show uh, our host marcilda uh let know everyone that we run uh, every week on Wednesday at 12 Easter time. We are running uh, different talk shows and dedicate, with dedicated topics. And today topics is NFT and art and the future of investments in art. And uh, uh, that's, uh, we, we have another six minutes to answer questions uh, about the art. Uh, on the call, if anyone wants to ask a specific question, or I have a question from the audience uh, previously, what I received uh, from Greg, actually. Uh, just a second, I will open. Thank you for speaking, Dan. And Elena, I have a question, uh, art-related, so when, uh, and NFT sure. actually related, so I'll go after you. Oh, unless this no, no, go is... on, go on. I'm, I'm opening now, uh, but you go on with your question. Uh, so, Greg, you know, when you were talking about uh, Intercoin, as I understand it, you, you said it's a cross chain, right? The, the underlying. So, mm -hmm. uh, how does it relate to, say, Flow, uh, that's now teamed up with uh, Rarible, and also the Algorand blockchain? Are they similar to yours? No, or is uh, that different technologically? You, can, you can think of Algorand as a, a base layer protocol similar to Cardano or Solana. So, no, I don't. Oh, sorry, so. my mic. Yeah, yeah, I'm still here. Oh, my, his microphone was. Yeah. So, no, uh, you can think of Algorand and Solana and others as a base layer protocols as operating systems okay think of like your macbook it arrives imagine if it had no applications right you open it it's a nice computer it's got windows it's got menus you can like have a calculator that's an application but then that's it right let's say there's no app store what are you going to do with it <laughs> right that's how blockchains are blockchains are raw materials they're they're essentially the substrate on which you build applications of the technology so like intercoin the very first thing we do is build applications right and so the apps that we care about are in the beginning things that we help communities to do uh, and that includes governance voting statistics contests fundraising and so on one of them is escrow and what's interesting about the escrow contract is it started when we were paying developers and we said well you know they said, how do we know you have the money? And we said, how, we don't want to pay you everything up front. So we lock up the money and then gradually we exchange value, right? As they build more of the product, 
we release more money to them. We even have the income contract, which I'll show some other time with managers. Norman knows, right? Norman, it's uh, people releasing a certain amount per hour, per you know, per week. There's limits, but the idea morphed from there to like we can actually do cross chain. Um, the real thing about cross chain is that you know it doesn't matter anymore where the value is being represented. City Coins lives on the Stacks framework. All right. So when I get into the technology with other people, you know, I just today invited people to a, a discussion about um, identity and uh, verifying verified claims and verified uh, credentials. And uh, we're going to have a discussion about that. So all these things that we're going to discuss uh, also include having your identity go between blockchains, right? Having your value go between. And so Intercoin uh, is building this thing. We got grants to build this thing. Basically, it's going to move money from one blockchain to another blockchain in like five different steps. So like just run through really quickly. Step one, parties agree on what the trade is actually supposed to do, right? You discover who you want to trade with. You connect with them. You agree on parameters and then you sign the hash of the parameters, meaning you nail it down what you're going to do. Next, you have to lock your money in escrow. This is the key realization is that part three is you can verify that each other party has locked up their money and if they have it you don't enter into the trade this part three is actually very very different than most uh blockchain projects because most things are on chain and if they're on chain they're usually very expensive so what i was talking about earlier with meta transactions uh these are things that are happening off chain and uh you know there's there's certain um counterfactual uh, smart contracts and things like this. But what we want to do is basically use the game theoretic uh, model to, to make it so that it's completely trustless. Parties verify that the other party has locked up their tokens for a while, okay? Then they start posting on each other's chains that they authorize the transaction. So like Alice posts on Bob's chain and Bob posts on Alice's chain in the first half of the lockup. So then the second half of the lockup is when they claim their money. They each find their transactions on the other chain and they repost them on their chain. Rather, they repost the payload. So in the end of the day, each party ends up with the other, uh, the other's uh, assets and the trade was completed. You can buy NFTs on Solana with USDT on Ethereum. You can trade USDT on Ethereum for USDT on Solana. There's so many things you can do uh, cross chain. So Intercoin, just like Interledger Protocol, and Stefan Thomas, who I hope to interview soon on this show, um, are working on essentially interoperability between blockchains and therefore uh, erasing the, let's just say, lock-in that people have. So you will no longer pay exorbitant Ethereum mining fees because who really wants that? Um, you can just move everything over to some other thing and it won't matter where it lives because it can move at any time between blockchains. That's what Intercoin okay, is supposed you. to do. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for that, for answering my question. Appreciate Absolutely. It. So, Elena, I think that was a great. Thank you very much, sure. Jack. Yes, <laughs> that was an amazing answer and very short and sweet. Um, well, I would like to thank you, everyone, and uh, for coming and for participating, and especially our guest speakers, uh, Leila and Alicia. Uh, and uh, Greg, uh, as always, you were fantastic with your presentation and with showing everything on uh, your screen, sharing your <laughs> screen. And as usually, uh, we would like to end uh, the show with uh, opportunity for everyone to know how to book a call with Intercoin. You're welcome to join our Telegram group and uh, you're welcome to Follow us, please, on YouTube and live stream uh, would be every week, as we said previously, from 12 Easter time, 12 till uh, 2 p.m. Easter time on Wednesday. That's right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Hope to see you soon. And please join the Intercoin community. If you like this, you'll see more info over there. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. And nice to meet you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.
Thanks. Thanks so 